like love is everything. Love is everything. You know, even on the worst day, love is what is the self to the human experience. Welcome back to the Lisa LaCroix show. My guest today is a men's mentor and teacher who supports his clients in the areas of life purpose, emotional intelligence, mental clarity, deep intimacy, and conscious relationships. He's dedicated his life to deepening his own experience of it and to love, success, brotherhood with men and living on purpose. Welcome to the Lisa Lacroix show, Max Tremblay. Yeah. yeah, thanks for having me, Lisa. I'm excited to be here. We met through the John Wineland teacher training. You were the first person who really reached out to me to say, hey, welcome in. I'm glad you're here. Oh, that's great. That yeah. feels good to know. Um, so we do have that shared history. And there's yeah. so many things I want to talk with you about today. But one of the ways I like to start my conversations with people is by asking them to share something from their childhood or their early years or their family of origin that they feel has shaped who they've become, how they're showing up in the world now. And I haven't prepared you for that, but I'm wondering if there's anything that comes to mind. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <clears throat> you know, when I think back to my childhood, I was really given a beautiful gift. And the gift was I had a father who was an incredible engineer and really was after doing big things with his life, impossible things, in fact. Um, and he, he did a number of things. He invented some things in the 60s and 70s that changed the world. And so growing up with this understanding of, you know, my dad is smart, he's driven, he owns his own companies. I had that modeled to me, which was really great. Now, there's other things I got from my dad that were challenging and difficult. But, you know, I had a dad that really showed me what it meant to be on purpose and living well in that way and successful. From my mom, I got one of the most amazing, like, full adored of loving mothers like she just loved her kids and it's the most incredible thing like i was born in this almost like genuinely perfect you know as a three four year old perfect moment um what happened next was incredibly difficult she was sick for a long time and while she was sick she was sick for a decade before she passed away while she was sick her constant battle was between how do i continue to show up in life while dying in service of love and community. And so that might be really hard to be a child experiencing, but the thing that I ultimately got was, wow, my mom was such a fierce commitment to love. And all the way to the end, you know, she just stayed on that path, um, even as she, you know, got weak and withered away. And um, yeah, and so, you know, I, I think my childhood it wasn't perfect. There was a lot of difficulty, but there were some things that really formed this basis that I now see as, you know, I learned de determination and and um, really going for things that are beyond what we would see as possible from my dad. And this idea that like love is everything. Love is everything. You know, yeah. even on the worst day, love is what is the self to the human experience. So those are the things I really learned. What comes across in that description and that in the, in the things you've chosen to highlight are so exactly what I know you to be committed oh. to, which is purpose <laughs> and love. I want to deepen a little bit more into something you just talked about. How do we live an exquisite life in the face mm. of death? I know you were quite young when your mom was going through that. Uh, I'm wondering if there's a little bit more that we could talk about around the role that facing death plays in recommitting over and over again to love. Because um, for me, that seems really like one of its powerful gifts, but we live in a culture that does not encourage us or invite us to talk about or really even think about or feel into the experience of death. And I, I feel yeah. it's so central. This idea that we're going to die and yeah. today is what we're judged on. Like it could be tomorrow, it could be a month from now, it could be years from now, but the way we live every day is what we're judged on. When someone gives a eulogy, it's like, oh, Max was a great guy. Like he really fought for like the best of possibility. And that only is because I live for that today. You don't get judged on the final day of your life. You get judged on the way you lived it. So 
That's the first thing. And why I say that is because what I learned from my mom, so I was age six to 16 was when she was sick. Well, I was six to 16. She passed when I was 16. She had cancer and it came three times. And each time it came, she went through this kind of wavering phase of like the hardship of receiving the diagnosis, getting into the confusion of like, what do I do? Working on the process of trying to heal and then coming back to like, whatever, here we are. Okay. Next birthday party next church event. You know, she was really big in the church that I grew up in. Uh, she organized a lot of things and she just kept showing up even when things got hard. And, you know, I wish I could ask her, uh, well, I probably could, I could probably just sit quietly and ask her and I'd probably get the answer, but I, I wish I could ask her, what did you learn, you know, in, in choosing to love and live life, even as you felt like it was ending? And one of the things that I do know to be true is she was very rooted in her belief in God through Jesus. Uh, I grew up Catholic and she had written some letters to friends near the end of her life where um, this pivot from self-pity and sadness pivoting toward this is my greatest work. Like the work I do when I'm dying is the work of me. That was really what she believed in. And as she got toward the end of her life, you know, she... She really attached to like, you know, the suffering of Jesus. Uh, she really understood it because as he was suffering, he was still speaking to the glory of God and the potential of love and, you know, everything else that he uh, was a stand for. And she really got that. And she, mm -hmm. she, she wrote a letter to a priest friend that was just like, I really understand what it means to be on your cross and still being a conduit of light and love. And she didn't say it that way, but that's the language that I use. And, and the, you know, the other thing is I come from Boston, Massachusetts. And so the culture I grew up in is no matter how hard life is, you know, this comes from the Irish Catholics up in Boston, no <laughs> right. matter how hard it is, we're just going to keep going. We're going to persevere. We're going to keep working, grind, grind, grind. And so most of my life was just grind without love. Now my life is what I would call love and determination. So it's the healthy side of, you know, grind. Like I'm determined to create in my life, but I do it from a place of love and, you know, ultimately the liberation of the human spirit is what I'm after. So that's what I with you on the liberation of the human spirit through yeah. the path of love. So I think there's something that we really get from death that we don't always recognize in our culture. So, oh yeah. So yeah, we deny it. We deny it. And, yeah. and it leads us in some ways to our purpose. I know that when I started my first podcast, it was very much because my mother was a stand for me having a voice in the world and she was very quiet. And uh -huh. so I'm going to guess that there's a connection for you. Well, you've just, you've just drawn it actually yeah. that you, from your childhood experience, you have this experience and commitment to purpose and to living fully in life. And the way that I look at it these days is that I had a really exquisite experience of love as a child. And, um, and then I lost that in my teens and I, I was from 16 to 18, I was pretty much alone completely. My dad was in his grief and I was just like, I am alone. I don't have anybody. And mm. from that moment until age 35 or 36, so a good 20 years, I was just in the muck of darkness. I was in a hard, hard life. And I now know that at 36, I decided to reclaim what it meant to be, you know, liberated, like in love and purpose. Ultimately, the things that I learned from my parents, like to be on purpose and to be loved, like, and, you know, they had, they had difficulties in their relationship. So I'm really just, I want to just clarify, like my dad really taught me purpose and determination. My mom really taught me love. And so I just was like, how do I get that back? How do I create yeah. that for myself? And that's the thing that that's been my whole life reclamation path, like, what is the work I need to do to bring me back into this way of living so that I experience love and I can be love to the people that are around me? That is the perfect segue into what I wanted to raise next, which is yeah. the concept of the concept of reclamation. Now, in my yeah. model of artful aging, one of the primary tenets is reinvention. And yes. you know, it doesn't matter whether you're aging in the second half of life or you're aging as a part of living a life, whether yeah. you're in your prime prime reinvention or as you've talked about it rec reclamation is a path to living a powerful life i want to talk a little bit about that process and specifically around the six things that you've mentioned that is needed to live an epic life reinvention and reclamation are the same idea what yeah. it is is we arrive at a moment in our life where we go this is not the life that i want to be living and it might be just right. slightly off or it might be dramatically off but at some point midlife crisis, whatever. There's a bunch of different ways to look at this. If we have early life trauma, that actually separates us from our, our, our truth. And we live in relationship to the trauma until we decide I am not of this trauma. I am something bigger than, and, and that's the reclamation piece. It's, it's yes. coming into what am I really here to do? What am I really here to be? Who am I here to be and live as for, I, for me to feel, you know, dialed in on life? 
I'm not the original person that came up with like the five most important things to look at in life or to, you know, focus on. But after working with men for a decade and really realizing men need structure and they need to understand exactly what we're talking about. So if I just teach things like meditation or I teach things like emotional intelligence, uh, it just feels so separate and it doesn't make sense as a singular unit. And so what I did is I just basically looked at, okay, what are the six things that we need to dial in and focus on uh, to really feel fulfilled in life? And what they are is mental health, physical health, emotional health, which is emotional intelligence and well-being spiritual health, and then living on purpose. So knowing what you're doing with your life and the relationships. Yeah. The relationships you foster between your love partners or your children or the people around you. And so yeah. when we, when we look at these six things and we look at, am I fully in integrity with my full expression here? And, and we do the work to become full in integrity with that thing. I mean, I just, this is the work that I've done and I do this with men constantly. I do this with women too. And once you bring someone into awareness of those six things and they start to work on those six things, everything starts to unfold in life perfectly. Like it really, like, it's like the magic that is life and everything that life is here to give you just starts happening. I love how whole and complete it is and also how clear a structure it is because as soon yeah. as I heard you talk about those things, for me, it's super clear. I don't even, I, it's really clear. Yeah. All those four things that are standard ones, the, yeah. you know, the physical, the mental, the yeah. emotional, the spiritual, and then adding in the purpose piece yeah. and the relational piece makes yeah. it so, it's the whole, so thing. whole and complete. Yeah, totally. And those first four are the self, that's the individual, right? So yes. just like making sure I'm right in my body, mind and spirit. And then the other two are making sure I'm right in what I'm doing with my time and who I'm doing it with, which is yes. part of the human experience. We're here for a period of time and we're going to be involved with other people and we're going to have things to do. And so most of the people that approach me, they're like, I don't know what's wrong in my life, but something's off. And I'm like, okay, cool. Let's look at this framework. And as soon as we look at the framework, we say, oh, okay, well, you're wildly out of integrity with this one. Like that's the thing that's now your baggage, your burden. Yes. The thing that is your struggle in life is where we're not dialed in on these basic core tenants. Nine years ago, you went through a massive transformation and you committed oh, yeah. to reclaiming your life. You committed yourself to five years of deep work in mm -hmm. that process. And so maybe share a little bit about what your own journey is in reclamation and in reinventing your life through yeah. those six elements. Like even if you don't, you don't want to go through all of them, what are some that seems the most, seem the most relevant? <clears throat> um, there was some relational difficulty I was having in my past marriage, my, my first marriage, and I didn't know how to work with it. So I went and saw a therapist and her suggestion was that I get really clear what is actually true in any given moment. And the way to do that is to recognize what your mind is doing, what your emotions are doing, also what your partner's mind and emotions are doing, and be able to separate out from just the volatility of any experience. And so I read The Power of Now on her suggestion, and that really started everything because I started meditating. And then I was like, oh, my God, this is different. Like, uh, this is an entirely different way to live, like to be aware of oneself, not only what your mind is doing, but what your emotions are doing and what you're feeling. And so when that started happening, that was when I was like, uh, OK, I'm missing some core pieces of how to be a human. And and then I just said, OK. Where else am I missing things? Like, what do I not know? And about a year later, I, I, I filed for divorce. I gave my ex the business and the home that we had uh, purchased. And I just decided to go all in. So I read something about how we lose joy and play as children because we get serious about life and how, how um, horrendous of an experience that is. So the grief of losing your childhood and becoming an adult. And... Um, and so I thought, okay, let me just reclaim joy first. And so I went out and I did some experiences that really had me living at the edge of my play, like joy, play. Mm -hmm. um, and that was like a lightning bolt of realization. I was like, wow, to have a good life, you have to be having a good life. It's not going to happen <laughs> tomorrow. You actually have to do the thing that feels good. So whatever that might be. Um, and, you know, for everybody, it's different. But for me at the time, it was just to do like kind of these wild adventures and just have, have a really good time of it. After that sort of washing joy through my beingness and reclaiming joy in my life, I then said, okay, relationship is what I'm after. I, I want to have kids. I was 36. And so I was, a lot of people are in their like late thirties and forties and they're like, yeah, someday I'm not that kind of person. I was like, I'm 36. I want to have two kids. I want to get to it. I want to find the love of my life. And I know how challenging dating can be. So I was like, okay, I'm fiercely committed to figuring out the dating world and how to do this effectively. So I 
read a couple books on love, really figured out what love was, how to experience love, what are love languages, what are the things I need to feel loved, you know, the whole deal. I like really dove deep on what is love and I learned. And then I set up a structure on how do I date for a year to find the love of my life. And I did it. I dated like 20 people. Four of them I dated for a second, third or fourth date. And as I went through the dating process, I just realized, okay, good person, not who I want to spend my life with. How do I bow, move on and just carry on? And so I did a year of dating and I got to the end of the year and I hadn't found my partner. Um, so I just started listening to that Supreme song, You Can't Hurry Love. And I was just kind of like in that moment and I went to get off, <laughs> went to get off the social, uh, the, the dating sites and Kelly popped up, uh, you know, Kelly, Kelly's my wife. Mm -hmm. So she popped up and on the day I was getting off the dating sites, she had just got on the dating sites. Oh and my God. It was like, was... Yeah, yeah. Universal. Unbelievable. For sure. Unbelievable. Yeah. And so she popped up and I was like, oh, okay, maybe whatever. I didn't even put that much effort because I was kind of like really done dating and we matched the next morning and I, I even like the first thing I sent her in a message was like the worst opening line ever. Cause I was so careless. Cause I was like, I don't even think this is going to be real. And she responded immediately with like, okay, I was like, do you know what it was? Can you share what it was? Like, what yeah. Was like, yeah. Was like, yeah. So I'm really into healthy food and I eat healthy food. And she had this thing where she's like vegan mama of a three-year-old, like healthy food, lifestyle stuff, blah, blah, blah. And so I, I think my first line to Kelly on Tinder was, uh, something like it's pretty fucked up that we actually have to define what healthy food is in 2023. Oh, nice. And, I mean, it's that's not careless. It's, that's actually kind of cool. Well, yeah, yeah. You, I, didn't I, right, a lot right, of, right. you didn't feel a lot of a lot of investment in it. I, I was on the way out the door, and so yeah. anyway, and she responded. She's like, "Yeah, no kidding." And then we just hit it off on topics of like, what is what is like food, you know, like blah, 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 all this stuff. And by that night I was like, I've got to, I got to talk to you. Can, can, can you call me? And so then we like got on a call and that's it. I mean, our first date was April fool's day and we've been foolishly in love ever since. And it's been delightful. I have a great relationship. Uh, it's so beautiful. You create a lot of content and offerings that offer insight to men in particular about what women sure. want in relationships and what yeah. women want from them. And I, 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 I bookmark that as presence, engagement, and leadership from yeah. the content and that energy. you created. And yeah, energy, yeah. right. Yeah, and energy. Totally. And I'm pretty sure that most of the women who listen to your content are a fuck yes to that. But how yeah, do men respond? Are men open to hearing that? And I ask because I feel like men are very confused about what women want. And I'm wondering yeah. if it lands in them beautifully or if there's resistance. It's interesting that you asked that question. So I've been working with men for a long time and there's actually a problem right now in our society where men have been hated on for a long time, you yeah. know, and it's kind of the shadow of feminism, but also just our culture in general, which is like men are the problem. White cisgendered men are the problem. And so 100%. What, what we have is we have a lot of men that are just like, I'm tired of hearing that I'm the problem. I'm tired of hearing that I can't do or I, that I'm not doing it right. And it's kind of a big wound in the masculine. And so when I get out on my platforms and I'm like, man, this is what you need to do. Um, the reality is I don't get a lot of responses from men. I mean, men that are doing the work are all like, yes, thank you. This is exactly right. But then the mm -hmm. majority of men tend to kind of just be like, oh, great, more of that. Because it feels kind of like, I, I think what it does is it provokes the shame, the shame around not yeah. being good enough. But what I will say is I sell out my men's circle and I, I work with a lot of men, you know, men do end up coming through, um, you know, my website or my Instagram and being like, Hey, I've got to work with you. You know, I just onboarded a client the other day who's just like, my life is totally effed up. I don't know what's going on. And mm -hmm. I just had a kid and, uh, and like, she's pregnant again for my second kid and I've got to figure this out. So, you know, I, I get men who are just like, cool, this guy gets it, like help me out. And that's great. I love that. Cause I can really work with that very easily. Um, what's harder to work with is the men that, you know, just ultimately are like, I don't want to do anything. Like I'm mad at the world. I'm mad at women. Like, and, and I'm yeah. glad that I don't get that energy. Cause I don't really want to handle, I mean, I get having resentments at the feminine cause of the, the way the world feels right now. But at the mm -hmm. same time, like that's some deep mom wound stuff that if, unless someone's committed to healing it, like, you know, I don't want to work with like, you know, the red pill world basically is what it is. Yeah. You're, you're hitting on something that I've been feeling deeply into. There is a lot of like what exactly what you're speaking to a yeah. lot of uncertainty, a lot of insecurity, a lot mm -hmm. of confusion, and probably yes, a lot of anger because of the way that the world has gone. I mean, me too had to happen. It was really important, but the, the totally. collateral damage to men has been big. And I think we don't have enough compassion to it. So I love that you're taking that stand and yeah. that you are attracting the people who are ready for it. And for even the people, I like to believe even the people who aren't quite ready for it, it's still a seed it. planted, you know? Yeah, they're hearing it. They're hearing it. One of the pieces of content I, I looked at uh, in prep preparing for this was one where you pointed out that when you bring her what she wants, you're more likely to get what you want. Yeah, 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 totally. I know I try to create incentive here to get people to be like, oh, that makes sense. 
But it's true though. It it's true. true. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Show up in your relationship and light your woman up to love, and watch how good your relationship gets. You know. Yeah. Every man can be inspired by, hey, you want to have more sex? It's like here you go, light yeah. her up. <laughs> you know, it's that simple. But also, yeah, you know. And, and one thing I guess I will say is, I've had men that have reached out and they've been like, I've been following you for a year. And I don't know if I'm ready, but like, what, what do you recommend? What's a book to read? Right. And like, mm -hmm. that's a great opening. Like that, that's awesome. Yes. So I'm just going to take a stand for the highest ideal. And when men are ready, come on my way. And that, you know, that I'm not a recovery group. I'm not work. I don't want to work in drug and addiction stuff. Right. Um, it's just not the right energy for where I want to live. I want to, I want to be a stand for like, life is good. We can crush it. Let's go, you know? And by yeah. being that, um, it just attracts a certain group of people. I really do have so much, um, so much compassion for men. And so yeah. I'm glad that you're doing that work. But I do face the same thing when I want to support men in, in seeing some of the things that they maybe don't see. And yeah. in dating world, you see a lot of that. You get a oh, lot yeah. of sense of, oh, okay, there's some missing pieces. And totally. my stance is for you to be better in your communication. My stance yeah. is for you to be more self-aware of what you want. My yeah. stance is for you to be complete in your communication and close things with integrity. Yeah. But it's for the it, the desire for awareness around it is for the purpose of more connection and totally. more love and more. Totally. So yeah. it's a tricky thing to, to be a stand for. Just got to be an unwavering stand for it and you yeah. just got to not worry about when people don't meet you there you know I, i'm coaching yeah. a woman in dating right now and one of the things that she's struggling with is like she keeps almost meeting the right guy like he's almost good enough over and mm -hmm. over again and she's like what do i do like i want and i'm like just move on bow move on get good at saying thanks and i'm complete and she's adjusted into that space and she's like wow i feel so good i don't owe these men anything like we go on a date or a second or third and then i'm like no this ain't my guy and then she bows moves on and now she's like now she's kind of moving through men and that's one of the things about dating is that we have to just kind of get through it and not like you're not here to yeah. caretake the men at their weakness you're here to actually just discover if you have a partner that's equal in their way of being when you're dating one of the things i realized when i was dating was ah, there's a lot of women out there that aren't ready for the kind of relationship i'm interested in and instead of making it mean anything about women or even those women in particular i just said cool you're delightful not what i'm looking for I think a lot of times women feel that and we don't necessarily know that men are experiencing the same thing. Oh, it's the and, same. <laughs> I also love that you reference giving the bow and saying thank you. I have a, a model which is thanking for what was the truth. Yeah, thank you. you. Know, what was the experience? Yeah. Um, recognizing the truth, my truth of my heart is I don't feel this is really a good fit. You know, I'm right. super grateful and completion, which is the bow, which means uh, totally. you know, it's been great. I wish you all the best or it could mean, hey, let's stay friends. The way that I structured it when I was dating was I would say, you know, thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Here's what I, you know, it's it's actually funny. Here's what I love. World. Here's what I loved. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would always say like, you know, what I really love about you and who you are in the world is whatever. And yeah. and then I would say something like, and this this isn't what I'm looking for, but I hope you the best. And like occasionally people would be like, well, why isn't it working? And then I'd be like, well, okay, here's the, here's the truth. And I would just be as clear as I could be, you know? That's almost exactly the same as the way that I do. Yeah, Not great. many people do that. And yeah, no, nobody does it. Nobody does it. I had, I I've had one person in the time that I've been dating for the last four or five years do that. And I felt so much of a, a an uptick Elevated in my, yeah, in how my impression of him, I was, I yeah. was really impressed by it. It really made a big impact on me. So, yeah. And it also gets rid of the residual hooks that are left over when people are like, oh, but what's going on? If we ghost people, it's like. If you ghost three people, now you got three people that are still hooked to you energetically. So you might as well try to be clean in your dating so that you can move on without baggage, you know? I wonder if you oh, could talk no. a little bit about your journey to men's work. It started because I read The Power of Now, uh, 2015, and I was like, oh my God, I didn't know this is a possibility. And as soon as I realized that, I was like, and I'm sure no other man knows this. And so I just reached out to a couple men and I was like, do you guys want to get together and have dinner and sit by a fire and kind of talk about some ideas? So I had no experience running men's circles. I didn't know men's work was the thing. Um, and then, so I just had like six guys and I made dinner it was, I was in rural Virginia at the time I made dinner. We talked about meditation and then we sat around the fire and, and I've been running it every month since, um, I moved it to Louisiana when I moved back down to new Orleans. Um, and now, I mean, it's just crazy. I, I sell out at 30 seats. I got 30 seats. And so basically I sell out every six months. I open it to new people or people can leave if they've been around for the past six months. Um, and it's just a great process like men show up and I just bring some teachings around the stuff that matters to men how to work with things and then we do support and so I just say like what's alive for you and everybody has the same like top seven things that they're going to say when things are not going well um yeah. 
Interesting. Actually, it's probably like it's probably like the top three. There's like probably three things that people bring. So then we work it and we just work that guy's individual stuff. And everybody's like, oh, that's an, that's, that's great. I can use that in my life. And, you know, that's kind of how the process works. And the thing that I've realized is the reclamation of man, you know, is, the reclamation of man is going to come through leadership of men. Like men need to lead men toward their best way yes. it's, uh, because otherwise there's a mother dynamic that comes in yeah. and men just can't be led by women. They need to be led by men who they want to be like, or they want to live like. And so, you know, I really believe in men's work. I, there's some men's work that happens within the church. I live in the South. And so there's some men's groups that are in the churches around here. And I think that's good, but uh, it's missing a crucial component, especially around leadership and like fierce leadership and emotional intelligence, you know, because a lot of it kind of bypasses everything to be like, well, God, well, prayer. And it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, those things are important. But um, I've got a couple guys that are in church groups that have come to my stuff and they're like, oh, this is what this is where it's at. I think historically in our culture, yeah. one of the missing links for men has been the leaning on each other. I, I don't mm -hmm. it probably historically doesn't go. I don't know how far it goes back historically, but certainly in our modern About 300 world, years. Yeah. there's a prohibition in some way or some stigma around men leaning on each other, men asking yeah. for help, men having support with each other. And it's so encouraging to me to see so many people in our circles and i know john has a vision of a thousand you know in, of inspiring a thousand men's groups and i just yeah, yeah. love the fact that men like you and other people in our communities are creating places for men to celebrate and lean yeah. into and develop brotherhood we've really lost our way and especially with people that immigrated to the united states we completely broke from our like you know, in, in, I've seen this in Europe, I've seen this in different parts of the world, like there's still sort of village mentalities where people are sort of centered around their villages to a degree in a lot of the world. Um, and that's a threshold. So like minimally to like totally living in a village still mm -hmm. exists on this planet. But when people immigrated to the United States, by and large, we completely broke free of our familial and um, ancestral village chain. And we started creating other situations. The United States is very much an idealistic society. And so what really has been happening a lot for men is they just are like, okay, I need to serve, like, I need to serve my family, we, like get successful, whatever. Um, but there's been a lot, a, a real loss of men among men. Um, but you know, it's, it does exist in yes. the early 19, 1900s, you know, Napoleon Hill had a men's group, it was just geared towards business, but it was just yeah. a bunch of men getting together. And the Masons, you know, there's all these different structures where men get together, the Masonic lodges, you know. But they but they are primarily focused on, they have been primarily focused on business. And I think that's the unique iteration that's happening yeah. right now is the gathering of men being more wide ranging or more inclusive of all 100%. six of those components instead yeah. of just focused on business building masterminds, you know. Oh, man. Yeah. The holistic man. That's the thing. Yeah, it's I love that. It's not just about success. I personally believe that revolutionary revolutionizing fatherhood is one of the keys to altering our humanity's path into oh, our planetary experience. It's everything. Yeah. And I you celebrate it and you model deep commitment to fatherhood. And yeah, I'm going to say that you're pretty unique in that. I can't think of too many other people who take such a public stance on social media for fatherhood as one of the paths to expressing yeah. love and to healing. So talk a little bit about that. I love being a dad. I love my kids, my son, River. He's just, he, today's his ninth birthday actually and we're gonna, go, we're, gonna, we're gonna get him some fish he's really excited about fish um but yeah he's crushing it in baseball so i go to all his practices i go to all his games i practice all the time with him and i love it because that's what life's about it's about playing catch it's about getting hit in the i got hit in the shoulder the other day by i was helping you know pitch for batting cages and this kid like cracked a line drive and i didn't get out of the way cracked me in the shoulder and i thought oh this is what it is to be a dad you're gonna get hurt you're gonna get beat up and it's gonna be the best <laughs> and so, you know, there's that. And then I went to my daughter's, um, she's three and she had like a Christmas thing and she was just like singing and doing these like cute dance moves, but she totally wasn't smiling. She was just doing the thing that she's been practicing with her class for like the past month. And I was like, I love this. I love this life. Mm -hmm. This is like perfect. Um, and you know, I just have to drop this in because I think it's the most important thing. I interviewed a bunch of elders uh, in 2017. I interviewed around 22 or 23 elders. And I just asked them basic questions like, what is life about? Like what really matters in life? And every single one of them said the same thing. Yeah. It was about their children. It was about raising their children. Yeah. And they, they, they were in all different economic brackets. I interviewed one guy who was like the wealthiest real estate guy in, in the entire state of Florida for like 20 years. So I like a really, really wealthy guy. I also interviewed someone who was still living in kind of close to impoverished, but happy about life kind of state. And every single person had the same thing to say. They were like, it's about the kids or it was about, I didn't spend enough time with my kids. And that's the one regret I have. Yeah. So I like, when I, when I heard that, I was like, 
it did two things. It created an North star for me. So I'm absolutely going to have kids and I got to find my wife. So that's what Mm -hmm. I learned. But the second thing was, I just realized when all things are said and done, no matter what you do in life, it's secondary to how we show up as husbands, fathers, whatever, you know, Mm -hmm. leaders. Mm. So I've, so I've just gone hard on it. I'm like, nothing else matters. It's just, I, I want to be the best dad I can be. I want my son to just know that he has a dad that has his back and supports yeah. him and really believes in him. And I just, I, I just try to live it. And then I just try to talk about that. I live it. Well, I don't even talk about that. I live it. I just show people like I post my son, like pitching yeah. or something. And you do uh, talk about it too. And I think it's really yeah, I meaningful. I, I think it is super important to be, to take a stand for it the way that you do, yeah. because it's not very commonly done. And A bunch of years ago, I interviewed, actually, I hosted a dinner for eight men from 27 to 60. And I asked them a whole bunch of questions about their experience. And seven out of eight of them did not have a meaningful, positive, emotional male role model in their life. Yeah. And the second thing was the pressure to provide for their families. In, mm-hmm. And so what I walked away from that was, wow, there is there is an emotional component that's so important. And so well, that's one of the reasons why I really wanted to interview you, because I feel you're yeah. so committed to both those oh, yeah. elements, to being the father and to also being deeply emotionally connected to self and other. Yeah, it's just absolutely true that men, regardless of whether they have partners that are financially successful or not, men need to feel like they're capable of providing. And it's not just about finances. It's about, am I capable of providing, you know, a a healthy, you know, an uh, emotional environment? Am I capable of providing when things get hard? I live in, you know, New Orleans. I live in the American South on the Gulf Coast and we have a hurricane season. And so hurricanes happen. And something that I've been able to watch and see time after time after time, when there's a Uh, environmental crisis, men show up. And, you know, it's almost like you you think this has gone the way of the wind, but when you have an environmental crisis, things just go right back to the genders. It goes, you know, the women focus on the families and the men focus on getting the car packed, getting the car gassed up and getting the family out safely. Like every single time, it's the same thing. People that are stuck in their houses, we have this thing called the Cajun Navy down here, and it's amazing. It's just guys that are fishermen or guys that have boats that hunt. All of a sudden, they all assemble and they go, you know, they they go to the flooded areas and they get people out of their homes. And it's just like, wow, this is what masculine leadership looks like Mm -hmm. when people are in trouble, like men gather and can take care of business. And, you know, I'm sure some of these guys are alcoholics and terrible in relationship, but they show up when time when 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 they're being called to. And I see it over and over again. Um, and why this matters is because I coach a lot of guys and I'm just, I, what I realize is I'm like, where are you living at your edge, man? Like, where do you feel like you actually have some capability in life? And a lot of the men that struggle struggle because they actually don't, they don't feel like they could crush it when times get hard right. and they're not crushing it when times are easy. And so, um, yeah, there is this thing around men being capable of providing that is, and it's not just financial, but yeah. Um, providing, you know, food, clothes, shelter, safety. That's it. Like if you can provide those things, you can be pretty dialed in as a man. I love that you're highlighting the importance of that as a centerpiece. And I also think that that has been so much the only focus in the past that it's such a beautiful expansion that you add all the other ways of supporting and connecting in. So it's 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 definitely a both end. Yes. Can you crush it on this basic sort of culturally understood level? And what can you add to that? Since the dawn of mankind, all we've had is, can we be safe and protected? Mm. So, you know, a million years of human history, 40,000 of human history, if you're from Europe. And, um, and that was the way for the entirety of it. The man was in charge of safety and providership and the woman was in charge of nourishment. But now what we are is we, with the luxury of, you know, we, we have a lot of privilege because we live in such a luxurious civilization. And inside this civilization, what's happening is men that are just taught how to provide but aren't emotionally capable or, you know, just healthy in, in terms of the, you know, the six tenants, um, they will feel the lack and yeah. they will have shame because they're like, yeah. oh, I'm, I'm not doing it right. You know, my relationship's falling apart or my kid hates me and, you mm. know, whatever. Yeah. Well, I'm really grateful that you're doing that work. I, I, I know that you're like me in the sense of you are deeply committed to constantly evolving in your own personal growth. And that actually circles us right back to where we began around reinventing our lives. So I'm wondering if you share something that's current for you, what you're working on, what are your, your current edges right now? I am absolutely invested in continuing growth. Like once we start to evolve and deepen our way of being in life, like to continue to do that process. But I also think it's really important to take breaks and to pause. So Mm -hmm. do some growth, 
slow down, get present with what is and chill for a second and then do some more growth and then slow down and get present because the self growth world is very selfish and kind of, um, it's just like, it's, you know, if I look at self growth for myself, I'm just always me, 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 what do I need to do to be better? And that's kind of a very selfish way of looking at life. And mm -hmm. so I think it's important to balance it with no, what's real in my life. And, you know, so what I've found is that I've gone through these periods of growth and then I go through a period of rest. And then it's the same if you're working out, like you work out one day, you rest the next day. So over the past couple of years, my historical career, what I did for the past 15 years, um, I'm starting to close that down as this new business is emerging. And uh, uh, I started the business, the company that I own now, it's a coaching and men's work and leadership business, started it three years ago. And so I have been really balancing as these things are, um, you know, as the new business is growing, but now it's growing so fast that I'm like, okay, like I'm really at my edge in terms of time. And like just this morning, I got really clear exactly down to the minute where my available time is throughout my week so that I can structure everything better because I'm just at a point where I'm I'm like insanely busy. Mm -hmm. And I've got my kids baseball game and I've got, you know, my kids were sick last week and my wife and I cook dinner for my family every night. So I'm just like, okay, how do I really hold this well? And so my edge right now is just continuing to surrender into more I mean, yeah. that's the biggest thing. First, you expand your capacity to be with it all. But eventually there's just so much that there is no like, it's just like, OK, life is bigger than me and and just surrendering into it. And and, you know, the other thing is asking for help. So I'm, I'm really I'm such like a, I get it done myself and I've been leaning into asking for help. So I've hired some people, you know, on, on teams to do different things for my business. And um, and that's kind of my edge. And I think, you know, where I'm heading in my work. A lot of my focus over the past couple of years has been engineering the human experience. So how do we have better relationships? How do we have a better sense of self? And how do I feel dialed in on my life? But what's really been happening over the past year for me while I'm doing this work, both um, in the world and also just on my own, there's been this whole new realm of sort of spirituality and this idea of what is what is life really about? And I've been doing a lot of work in that realm, just in my own personal practice. And also I have some curiosities on, on pathways to pursue teachings in that space. And so I think, you know, um, that's kind of the direction I'm heading is deeper spiritual truth and what that means and how to integrate that into our human experience. Because I really feel like one of the biggest problems we have in the world is just a lack of spiritual depth. Even psychologists who are completely secular still register this as a problem. You know, mm -hmm. like totally. when people are chronically depressed, it's like, well, like, what do you believe life is about? Like, what do you, and yeah. you know, this lack of bigger idea for life, this, it's not, it's not about purpose. It's about like, yeah. why is life a thing that's about available faith. to me? Yeah. And I, I'm not religious and I didn't grow up with religion, but it's always yeah. occurred to me that when we don't have faith and hope, yeah. whether you put that in religious terms or emotional terms that we, we ultimately are going to feel depressed and hopeless. Totally. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And so anyway, over the past couple of years, I've had these really crazy, like kind of spiritual experiences and, um, and they, they keep getting louder and there's more of them. And the mm -hmm. things that are happening for me in my life, as things begin to emerge, there's an undeniable thing here that I really am interested in pursuing. So I'm not sure what that's going to look like. Um, I love it. Yeah. You know, I'm committed to sort of a sober path of growth. And so I'm not looking to do like the ayahuasca thing or like the, mm -hmm. the plant medicine thing. I don't have any judgments of it, but I just want to be able yeah. to say like, I committed to self growth from a sober mindset. And so I'm really looking at, you know, mantra, prayer, and experiences that really bring me into a deeper relationship with God or source or love, whatever mm. the divine, whatever you want to put it. There's like a, there's like the church of Holy Cross. It's like these super Orthodox Christians in the Appalachian mountains. Like what if I spent a weekend there? Or wow. what if I went to like a Himalayan temple and spent a week studying like meditation there? So like, what if I really go into like the deepest practice of all of the major religions that are operating right now? And see what, the, what see what I can learn from that, and um, that might be part of my path. The other thing is I'm currently working on an uh, initiation um, immersion for men, where I'm going to take men out into the caves in Europe where the oldest sculptures were found. You know, where like European men first began to emerge as a uh, modern humans, and I'm going to bring them through kind of shamanic sacred practices. And so that's just where my life is heading. It's just like mm -hmm. getting into this kind of other realm of reality so yeah, rich cool. and juicy really yeah. really exciting i know there's oh. a lot coming so it's really exciting yeah i can't wait to see where that takes you where that leads yeah. you and i are both committed to bringing 
a lot of free content and value to our audiences through yeah. our various social media platforms. And I know for myself, as someone who is a speaking coach and a communication coach, and I, my heart hurts when I see how much brilliance and wisdom there is in other people that's not shared with the world. Yeah. And so I, I know that self-expression really matters. And you do such a great job of showing up in oh, that way. Thanks. Yeah. And Thank you. Um, I mean, so much so that when I was planning, I just had to go to your last 10 posts and be like, oh, there are all the things that I want to talk about. So you're yeah. showing up with your commit com with your commitment and your purpose. Totally. And in my own experience that there's so much reticence I see, especially in the women that I work with to take up space. And I'm wondering if that's relevant mm. with men or if there's any equivalent. Well, let me just speak to anybody that's listening that is afraid of taking up space. It all comes down to how hard are you willing to work for the success that you deserve? Mm. You know, and that's the thing. I asked myself that question, like how hard I, I didn't want to do social media at all. I didn't, I was like not really on Instagram or Facebook. I'd post like once every 10 months on Instagram and I, I had a resistance to it. And then one day I just said, I mean, I work so hard in my life in every other way in all my other businesses. And I was like, wait, this is just the way it is. Like if I want to be available in a global way, then I need to show up on a global stage and the internet is the global stage, you know, social media is the global stage. So yeah. How, 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 like how, how much do you want it for the people out there that are afraid to show up online? Um, try, you know, just try. I had a friend who I was coaching and she had that kind of issue. She's like, I don't know if I want to do it. And I was like, do a hundred days. And then if you really don't want to do it, quit. And so she did a hundred days and she's like, yeah, yeah, it was good. You know, blah, 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 whatever. And she's like, I think I'm going to take a break. And I'm like, okay, cool. And she's, that was like a month ago. And she's posted like 30 videos since then. And I'm like, yeah, she's doing great, you know? And so she's just in it and she's doing it. Yeah. It's just a weird resistance thing. I mean, we make social media mean all this stuff and we're like, I don't want to do the thing, but it's like, whatever. I think also it's not just social media. It's that it can be vulnerable to show up and take a stance yeah. for what you really believe in and what you really want. But when our yeah. desire to have that impact and to have people be have the transformation that we see for them is greater than that resistance, then we just do it. Yeah. 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 And we get used to it. It's pretty easy to once you kind of get a flow going when you're doing social media or if you're I mean, social media is one thing, but imagine standing in front of 100 people or imagine standing in front of 20 people like the first five times are harder. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, okay, I get how this works, you know? And once I dialed in a production method for my social media stuff, it's really easy for me. I mean, actually, I and now I, it's crazy. This week I've been like, I'm just gonna use my phone again. Like I have all this like expensive gear. I've noticed like, that you're using I, your phone. Yeah. I was just like, I'm laying on in my bed, just like, here's my, you know, whatever. And and it's doing fine. Right before our uh, this interview today, I had a really great idea. So I went to record it and my shirt was unbuttoned, but I was like, I had one minute before we were gonna get on the call. So I was like, whatever, I'm just gonna record it. So I hit record and I'm buttoning my shirt and I just said the thing. It was like a 45 second transmission. And I was thinking I would just save it for later. When I ended the video, I was like, I'm probably just going to post that because it was perfect. I nailed yeah. it. And I was like, I'm buttoning my shirt, but I was like, whatever, life is life. I'm just going to totally. let people, eat. you know what I mean? Well, there are a lot of social media platforms that appreciate and nice. authenticity resonates with with that. So I think I it's mean, really nice. You yeah. have, you do such a great job of having such beautiful lighting and sound and <laughs> really great transmissions. I, I just am loving your social media presence. I have a series I call Creating from Bed, which is the same. I like oh, I I'm in bed, I wake up and I just say whatever comes to my mind. And I think having oh both God. is great. So. so nice. So to that end, tell people where they can follow you, how they can find you, how they can learn more. I'm on Instagram. Pretty easy to find. Uh, it's just Instagram Mac, slash Max Trombley. Um, my website is a shift in being.com. If you look up my name on Google, you'll find it. You'll also find some old photo companies that I used to run. Um, but a shift in being should come up. I guess I'm on TikTok too. And so if you're, if you're on TikTok, you can find me there. And I'll put all the links in the show notes so people can find you and follow you. Sounds great. And Max, I want to say thank you so much, not just for being here and spending this time with me, which has been really lovely. I lo loved getting a chance to deepen in with you, but also for the work that you do in the world that I see as being transformative and so, so important. Mm. So thank you yeah, for the work you do. Thank you, you so do. much. Thanks for being a good friend. Yeah. I love you, Lisa. You're great. Yeah. I love yeah. you too. If there's anything in today's episode or any other episode you've seen that you found valuable or interesting or important in any way, if you could share it with a friend. And while you're at it, make sure you subscribe to the channel and even better, also hit the bell, the like, the notification button. So you'll always be notified when I publish new content. And so you can help me to grow the channel. In the meantime, please do check out this video or this playlist where I think you'll find even more interesting information.